السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين The 10th of Rajab is the date of the birth anniversary of the ninth Imam, Al Imam Muhammad Al-Jawad And Rajab itself is a very blessed month in that there is a number of occasions, a number of significant occasions, uh, among them the birth of the 10th the Imam, Al Imam Al-Hadi, the, the birth of the ninth Imam, Al Imam Muhammad Al-Jawad, the birth of Imam Ali alayhi salam, Amir al-Mu'mineen on the 13th of Rajab, as well as other occasions. And it's a blessed month. It's a, it's a month of supplication. It's a month which begins to pave the way for the months of Sha'ban and Ramadan. And and Imam Muhammad al-Jawad salam, he was, as historians say, um, the only son of the eighth Imam, and Imam Ali ibn Musa salam. And this was significant because uh, the eighth Imam, if you study the history, you'd see that the eighth Imam was in a position not only of religious leadership and spiritual leadership, as we believe all of the Imams were. But there was also a time when uh, he had political leadership and influence. And that is when uh, Al Ma'mun al Abbasi, the Khalifa at the time, appointed him for a, a short period, appointed the eighth Imam as his heir, the next in line to succeed. And of course, that was retracted and, and uh, that position was taken away. But that was unique to the eighth Imam. And the ninth Imam was born a few years into uh, the Imama of the eighth Imam. And this was not normal. Uh, because whenever somebody was put in the spotlight, I mean, the, and the case was similar to the Prophet Muhammad oh, there was always an expectation that that person would have a son, an heir apparent, right away. And so the enemies of the eighth Imam, they would tease him that you are one of no lineage. And the mother of the ninth Imam, the wife of the eighth Imam, the, the mother of the ninth Imam was of African descent, of Nubian descent. And so when the ninth Imam was born, narrations tell us that his, he was of very dark skin complexion. And at that time, just like we have racism and prejudice and discrimination today, at that time there was also racism and prejudice and discrimination. And they would refer to him as the black one or the dark one in a, in a derogatory way, as to insult him. Some even suggested, and this is, this is ways that they would uh, attack the Imam, they, they even suggested that he was not his son because he was too dark to be his son. So the Imams also suffered racism, from racism and from discrimination and from prejudice. This isn't something which is new. And when you look at it, racism and, and prejudice and, and that type of discrimination is really a disease of the heart. It's a disease of the soul. And um, the Imams, Ali Musalam, they, they made a point, just like the Prophet had made a point, out of the fact that your status does not come from the color of your skin. Your status does not come from your ethnicity. Your status comes from your character. Your status comes from the good that you have to offer. Your status comes from uh, not only how uh, knowledgeable you are, but how you provide that knowledge to other people, how you transfer that knowledge to other people. And the ninth Imam uh, 
when, when, uh, when, when he was around nine years old, his father had passed away. The eighth Imam had passed away. And before he had passed away, people would ask, regularly people would ask the Imams, they would say, who is the successor after you? Because they knew after every Imam there would be a successor. They understood that inherently. So there's a narration, one of the companions of the 8th Imam, his name is Safwan ibn Yahya. He tells the Imam, the 8th Imam, he asks him, he says, who is the successor after you? And at this time, the 9th Imam, Imam Muhammad al-Jawad, was only three years old. So he says, this son. And so the companion asks him, he says, him, this young one, you know, am, I, am I seeing right, this young boy? And he says, yes, he confirms. He says, how? How at such a young age can we believe that he will be the recipient of God's favor? He will be the Imam after you. So in this narration, the Imam, the eighth Imam answers him and he gives him the example of the Prophet Isa alayhi salam. Narrated in the Quran in chapter number 19. That when Isa was brought with his, with his mother, Maryam alayhi salam, to the people, and the people questioned Maryam. Her reply was what? At first she did not have a reply. So she pointed to her baby. And this miracle, by the way, is mentioned exclusively in the Quran. It's not mentioned in the Old Testament or anywhere else. It's mentioned exclusively in the Quran that he himself answered them. He said to them, Inni Abdullah. I am the, the servant of God. I am the slave of God. Atani al kitab. He gave me the book, meaning that he revealed to me the book. The book that he revealed to him was the gospel. وَجَعَلَنِي He also, uh, uh, he, he, he made me as a prophet, as a messenger. وَجَعَلَنِي مُبَارَكًا أَيْنَمَا كُنْتْ He also blessed me wherever I went. Everywhere I go becomes a place of blessing. And of course, we know that this is also in the case of Yahya. When Yahya was uh, born to the Prophet Zakaria, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, number one, this child that we granted to Zakaria, because Zakaria wanted somebody that was going to inherit him, that number one, he was going to inherit me, and inherit from the family of Yaqub. Yaqub is Jacob, and um, that is whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made the most of the uh, prophets came from the descendants of Yaqub, Jacob, who was the son of Ishaq, who was the son of Ibrahim. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about him, number one, that he was the first one to be named Yahya. And the second thing that he says about him is that, وَآتَيْنَاهُ uh, الْحُكْمَ that we gave him wisdom and we gave him knowledge at a very young age. Sabiya, Sabi in, in the Arabic language, if you say Sabi, you're talking of, of, about a boy between the ages of, you know, past the age of being a toddler, maybe around the age of four, five, six, seven. That's called Sabi in the Arabic language. Wa So it was not unfounded. So the eighth Imam tells his companion, Safwan ibn Yahya, that, that in the same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted wisdom and, and He granted guidance for those prophets, He also granted it to my own son. And, and this was not unusual because you find that the, the Imams always groomed leaders to follow after them. And every great leader today of any organization, any great leader of any organization today groom somebody to be the leader after them. Never leaves an organization behind without any leaders. Once a person can achieve that level where they have groomed other leaders to take after them, then they can depart. The same goes with the Imams. And of course this was a decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that uh, the, the, the nation would be never left without leadership. So, the Imam was groomed from a very young age. He received teaching from his father and from his grandfather. Uh, the, the qualities that he had inherited in terms of uh, his intelligence, in terms of his speech, in terms of his mannerisms, 
also taken from his father, the eighth Imam, Al Imam Ali ibn Musa Raba, alayhi salam. So, we find that the Imam, his father passes away when he's nine years old, and he is the Imam from that time until he is in his mid 20s, and he passes away at the age of around 25 years old. And that's a very, very important age. You know, today we look at anyone uh, under the age of 18 as, um, you know, as, as children, as, as not adults, and they're, they're unable to make their own decisions. And then all of a sudden, overnight, once they become 18, they become of age, all of a sudden they're, uh, they're adults, and they have to uh, tackle life. They have to take on life within a few hours. And it's interesting because if you look at how uh, Islam teaches us to raise children, there's a hadith of the Prophet, and it divides the age, basically, of teaching children and raising children into three stages. So the Prophet says this. He says, from the time they are born till the time they are seven years old, he says, allow them to be free. That doesn't mean that allow them to do everything and anything. If they are doing wrong, you have to teach them. Meaning that the religious obligations such as prayer and fasting, it's, it's not obligatory upon them at that age. But teaching does begin at that age. So from, from the time they're born to the time they're, they're seven years old, that's stage one. Stage two is from, the, from, from seven years old to 14 years old. Here the Prophet says teach them their obligations. Before they reach that official age where they have to pray and fast and observe the hijab and so on and so forth, teach them once they get to the age of seven. And um, from the age of 14 to the age of 21, he says be strict with them, be, uh, uh, be, be a little bit more stringent with them. So, so dividing it into different areas rather than just having them you know, overnight, all of a sudden they become responsible and they have to take on all of these responsibilities. That's a very, very important age, that age right there. And if we can teach children to build a proper foundation from that age, you see them turn into effective adults. But the, the problem is today, you know, with the educational system and, and whatnot, it's not uh, uh, created to uh, create responsibility. All of a sudden, children are 18 and, and they're legal uh, guardians of themselves and you know, that's when the problems happen. Um, but you find that the Imam at this age, even though he was very young, you know, you, you, you read the ahadith and you find the, the impact that the Imam had on his society. So age was not, didn't make any difference how old he was. The Imam, because he was groomed properly by his father, because he was raised properly by his father and mother, uh, he did, he was able to uh, create an impact. And one of the areas of impact uh, that the Imam exerted himself was when it came to teaching uh, jurisprudence, fiqh. And there's a number of stories. You know, if, if you study our fiqh, our jurisprudence, uh, our basically what our halal and haram comes from, many of the narrations come from that period, from the time of the sixth Imam onwards. And you find many narrations that come from the time of the ninth Imam, Al Imam Muhammad al Jawad. You know, one of the uh, one of the very interesting narrations. Uh, it says that uh, when the Imam was of age, because he was born in Medina, and then he was summoned to Baghdad, and then there was a time where he returned to Medina, and then he was brought back to Baghdad, and 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 he uh, he passed away and he was buried in Baghdad. For those of you who have visited the shrine of Kadhimin. Houses the mausoleum of the seventh Imam, Al Imam Musa al and his grandson, Al Imam Muhammad al Jawad. Uh, when he was summoned to Baghdad, the Khalifa at that time was Al Mu'tasim. So, one thing that Al Mu'tasim had done was that he had arranged for all of the prominent scholars at that time uh, to come and, uh, and sit with the Imam and pose questions to the Imam so that they could stump him. Because, you know, there, there's this whole idea that he's the son of he's the son of the eighth Imam, and uh, and Mu'tasim was trying to show that you know it, it's not it's not such a big deal. So he gathered all the people he he mobilized all the people that he could to ask him questions and to try to stump him. 
So Yahya ibn Akham, who, who, was, who was the basically the equivalent of the Supreme Court Justice, the highest, the highest judge at that time, who was, supposed, who was supposed to be the most knowledgeable person at that time, he poses to him a question, which he believes, Yahya ibn Akham thinks that the Imam doesn't have an answer to this. So he asks him the question, he says, what is the expiation, the kafala, for a person who kills an animal in the state of ihram? What's the expiation for the person who kills an animal in the state of ihram? For those who have performed the umrah or the hajj, you know that in the state of ihram, when you're in the state of ihram, um, there are things which are prohibited for the person who is in the state of ihram to do. Among them is killing animals. But there are certain conditions, it's not a general rule. So if a person, for instance, is being attacked by an animal, then the person can defend himself without penalty, without expiation. So he asks him a general question, and for those of you who have performed the Hajj, you, would, you already know this, that the, the rules of Hajj are probably very complicated. That's why, you know, before sending you off to Hajj, we have classes sometimes, for those of you who have performed the Hajj with us before, because we want to make sure that people are educated, they understand what's going on, so that they don't make a, a mistake that can potentially ruin their pilgrimage. Right? You're investing a lot of time and a lot of energy, and for a lot of people, especially today, it happens only once a year. So it's good to be informed and educated on what you're going to do. And the rules are a bit complicated. Nothing that goes over the head, but they're a bit complicated. Some of them have uh, conditions and, and, uh, and whatnot. So he asks them the question. He says, what's the penalty? What's the expiation for a person who kills an animal during the state of Ihram? So what does the Imam do? Instead of answering the question, he, a he, asks, he begins to ask the questions to him. He poses about almost 10 questions back to him to show him that it's, it's more complicated than just one answer. So he asks him, he says, well, it depends. Did it happen during the night or the day? And was it for the Umrah or was it for the Hajj? Was the person within the vicinity of a Masjid al-Haram or was he in the Hill area, which is outside Masjid al-Haram? Um, was this person, did he do it from, on, on purpose or by accident or through forgetfulness? Those are three things. He says, um, was this person a free man or a slave? Was he young or old? Was that animal, was it a mammal or was it a bird or was it an insect? He asks him those questions and, and, and he shows him through asking that question that, that, that the, the answer depends upon what specific question you're asking. And then he provides the answer to every single case that he presented. So Yahya ibn Akram thought that he was, you know, he was going to be able to stump him. And, you know, by the way that the Imam provided the answer, it was obvious that Yahya ibn Akram did not have the answers to these questions. And the Imam wasn't trying to make a point. He wasn't trying to prove that he was the most knowledgeable. The Imam was in a, a position to disseminate that knowledge that had been passed on to him. And it's interesting, when you study the, the books of jurisprudence, you find that many of the laws that today pertain to the Hajj, the Ihram, they come from that very one Hadith. That one Hadith, that one exchange that the Imam has with a person. <laughs> so, you know, his, his ability to, uh, to explain and to disseminate and to provide answers in a way that was understandable to everybody at that time. So... What the Imam did was, was he, made, he made a difference. Even though he was young, but he made a difference and he made an impact. And that's very, very important today. You know, today when you, when you, when you study today's generation, when you look at um, people who are, who are Gen Y or, or Gen X or Millennials, right? One of the things that they want, if you, if you read studies about them, one of the things that they strive to do is to make an impact, to make a difference, to make a change. And I believe that the best role models for that were the Ahlul Bayt because so many of, of the Imams, when they took reign of the Imam, they were at a very young age. Many of them were at a very young age. So what happens, one thing that happens is that uh, um, he, is called, he is called to Baghdad, and when he is called to Baghdad, uh, he is offered to marry the daughter of al mamun And this was very interesting. First of all, 
when, when the leader, let's say the president, no bad example, when the king, say for instance, wants to offer his daughter in marriage to a person, you don't just flat out refuse. It's not an option for you to refuse. So, the Imam accepts to marry the daughter of Al Ma'mun. Her name was Umm Al Fadl. But Umm Al Fadl comes from the home of Al Ma'mun, right? She is, um, you know, she's, she's never had to struggle. She uh, has had everything she's ever wanted. Basically, she's royalty going into the home of Al Imam Al Jawad. And Al Imam Al Jawad, like all the other Imams, was a man of very humble means, right? Was not lavish or did not have an extraordinary lifestyle. You know, the Imams, you go into their homes and they had the bare bones minimum. So what happens when you bring the daughter of a king to the home of a very humble man? Well, him being now related to the Khalifa did not change him at all. It didn't change him at all. It didn't change his character. It didn't change his morals. It didn't change who he was as an individual. It didn't change his humility. He didn't see himself now as the son-in-law of the Khalifa. Now I'm entitled to a better lifestyle. Now I'm entitled to a more lavish lifestyle because I've earned the privilege or the status of being the son-in-law of the Khalifa. Not at all. It actually, nothing changed. And so many people, based on new relationships or based on new positions or based on a new status that they're given, their character begins to change. Or sometimes you see people, they're very humble when they don't have anything, just like the verses that were read before. When, they're, when they don't have anything, they're very humble, but then when God blesses them, it changes their character. It changes who they are as individuals. Or people are humble in the beginning of their journey, but all of a sudden, you know, if they've graduated with a certain degree, if they've received a certain honors, if they've re received a certain title or a position, a certain status, then it changes who they are, it changes who their character is. That happens so many times. Some people marry into families, and this is, this is something which, which is actually sometimes prevalent in our communities, is that some people marry into families and they forget about their own family. They abandon their own family. The Imam was not like this at all. The fact that he was the son-in-law of Al-Ma'mun, and by the way, if you read the narrations, that wedding was one of the most lavish weddings. Not by the will of the Imam, but you know, the father of the bride is the Khalifa. Very, very lavish wedding. Where the gifts, you know, the, the what do they call them? The party favors that the people were, were receiving were deeds to lands and gold and silver and, 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 and musk and amber and all these high value items people were receiving. But the marriage, you know, inside the home of the Imam was very humble. It didn't change him at all. But that wasn't enough for Umm al-Fadl because she saw herself as, as the daughter of the caliph. So she would, um, she, she would you know, continuously go to her father and, and she'd say, you know, Dad, this isn't enough. Why did you marry, marry me to this person? It never, changed, it never changed the character of the imam. Uh, and, 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 and truly, that's when you get to observe the true character of a person, when their status changes. That's how you get to observe, you know, they, they, they talk about how um, you know, sometimes money corrupts people or status corrupts people. Well, that was never the case for the Imams. Whether they were married into the, the, the family of royalty or they weren't, it didn't change anything about them. Their attitude was always consistent, right? Why was that? Because they lived on principles. And when you live on principles, no matter what your external factors are, nothing changes. Because you're, you're rooted, you're solidly rooted in principles. So, about his character, the Imam was a man, number one, of great intelligence. Um, he was able to uh, think fast and give immediate answers. And he had, he had excellent speaking manners as well. And I won't go into detail about all of you know, his interactions, but if you study his interactions with the people around him, with his companions, with the Khalifa, with this person, with that person, you'd find that he had excellent manners in speaking. He had excellent manners in presentation whether he was talking to a poor man, or whether he was talking to the judge, or whether he was talking to Khalifa, he was excellent in his mannerisms. And that's something which is characteristic of the Ahlul Bayt And so I'd like to narrate and just end with a couple of ahadith from the, the ahadith of the ninth Imam, 
alayhi salam. One hadith says the following. He says, do not act like the friend of Allah in public and his enemy in private. Some people tend to act like they are the friends of God in public, but in their private life, they are the enemies of God. So show what your true face is in public that you have in private. Meaning be consistent with your character. Be consistent with what you present to the public. That's number one. In another hadith, he says, and this is, uh, this is a more practical hadith. This is something that he narrates from his grandfather, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. He says, he says, rise up early in the morning for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, bestows, uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows his blessings upon those who rise up early in the morning. I say this to myself first. And finally, he says the following. This is a very important hadith. Another hadith that he narrates from his grandfather, Amir al-Mu'mineen. He says that Amir al-Mu'mineen said that when the Prophet sent me to Medina, so there was, uh, uh, when the Prophet sent me to Yemen, the Prophet had sent Imam Ali alayhi uh, salam on an expedition to Yemen in order to preach the message of Islam. The Prophet said to Imam Ali alayhi salam the following. He said, O oh, Ali, Anyone who expects goodness from Allah is never disappointed. When you expect goodness from Allah, not only that you ask it, but you expect it. Expectation is different than just requesting something. When you request something without expectation, you don't really know whether it's going to come or not. It could be a 50-50 thing. But when you expect it, that increases your chance of receiving that thing. He says, nobody, nobody is lost whenever they, whenever they expect goodness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, and it's, it's a very simple statement, but it's very profound because what, sometimes when we ask God for something, we're doing it half-heartedly. We don't know if God is going to grant us that thing or not. But ask those who have actually received what they have asked from God, and they will tell you that they have expected to receive that good from God. You know, a beautiful example of this and if you read the narrations of the Imams of Ahl Bayt if you read their supplications, in their supplications, essentially they ask God for something, but from the language that they use, you know that not only are they asking God, they're expecting, it's as if they know they are going to receive that thing. Because if they don't receive that thing, in their philosophy, uh, you know, when, when Imam Ali alayhi for instance, when he says, "Ma my Lord, if you punish me, "Ma meaning that it's it's not something that I ever expected from you to punish me. It's not something that I ever expected a person who has hope and faith in God that you punish him. It's not that's not what is expected from you. And he says that even if you were to punish me, even if you were to throw me in the hellfire, I would still expect good from you. I would still expect mercy. Uh, expect mercy from you. I would still tell the people of the hellfire how good of a Lord you are and how merciful of a Lord you are. So a person who expects goodness is never disappointed. And anyone who asks for his guidance has no cause to regret. One thing that you'll never regret in your life, there's many things that you can do in your life that you'll regret. But one thing that you'll never regret is if you ask the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, there's, there's, this is so profound because if you think about it, whenever you are receiving something, there's only so much that you can do physically. You know, say you're studying for a test, you want to ace that test. There's only so much that you can do physically. There's only, only so much studying that you can do. Whatever you do physically is only half of the equation. The rest of the, of the equation comes from where? It comes from asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. Because there are factors which are seen, there are factors which you can see and which you can feel and which you have control over, and then there are factors which are unseen. That's what we refer to as alim al ghayb. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is alim al ghayb, meaning that He has the knowledge of the unseen. That there are unseen factors which fall into the equation of your success. So a person who asks guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, instead of just trying to do something on his own or her own all of the time, shall never regret anything. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
to bless us with the ability to ask him for guidance. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we, we, uh, to, to allow us to have the expectation to receive good from him, inshallah. Brothers and sisters, on Saturday, inshallah, as was mentioned, we will be celebrating the birth of Imam Amin al-Mu'min alayhi salam here at the IECOC. Our program begins at 7 p.m. Inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma khurri al-Mu'minina wal-Mu'minat wal-Muslimina wal-Muslimat al-Ahya'i minhum wal-Amwat. Taba' baynana wa baynahum bil-Khayrat. Inna ka mujibu al-Da'wat. Inna ka qadi al-Hajat. Inna ka ala kulli shayin qadir. Bi rahmatika ya rahman ar-Rahimin. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ahli bayti al-Tayyibin al-Tahirin.